today is our first Sunday of Advent. The word Advent comes from the Latin word Adventus, which means coming. So in this season of Advent, we keep in mind both Advents of Christ. The first in Bethlehem and the second that is yet to come. So Advent, four Sundays leading up to Christmas. The time of the Old Testament, the people of God, the people of Israel, they're waiting and they're hoping for the coming of the Messiah. Throughout the Old Testament, we see Israel look back on God's goodness and his actions on their behalf, and they call out to God to act on their behalf again. In a similar way, the church, we the church during Advent, we look back upon Christ's coming in the name of Jesus, in celebration, while at the same time we look forward in eager anticipation to the coming of Christ's kingdom when he returns for his people. We celebrate the fulfilled promise of Christ's first coming and the yet-to-be-fulfilled promise of his second. The thing is, the promise for Israel back then and the promise for the church now is Jesus Christ. He has come and he will come again. That's the essence of Advent. That's the season that we're in. It's time to reflect on that. Um, so as our church enters into the season of Advent, we're going to focus on four themes. Today, the topic is hope. Next week, Kathy Charlin will be sharing a message on peace. For our third Sunday, Gary Rue will be preaching on joy. And on our fourth Sunday, which actually this year falls on Christmas Eve, so Christmas Eve morning, our uh, fourth Sunday of Advent, Steve Nevue will be sharing a message as well. So as we begin this first Sunday of Advent, we are going to um, ask Sue Cole and Bob Mines to come up and help us light our Advent wreath. Um, as you saw in the video, um, we have three candles that are purple and one that is rose or pink, and we'll save that for the third week, the week that we focus on joy. Um, so we are going to be lighting, um, just to make good use out of these candles, we're going to be writing, lighting this candle right here, and Sue, um, Sue is going to read our Advent scripture this morning from Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel. We also, during this season, um, some of you may remember last year that Sadie started um, kind of uh, hopefully a new tradition of having an Advent kind of devotional for families. I know last year she was expecting just people who had little children to take it. So many people in our congregation were excited about having this kind of daily or weekly devotional during Advent. So I'm going to ask her to just kind of come up and, and share that with you. <laughs> so um, this year I didn't, why reinvent the wheel? If you love what we do, keep doing it, it works. So um, last year you may remember that I handed out a folder like a little pamphlet like this, and then a map like this. So each week the, um, you'll have a daily reading, a weekly reading in here, and it starts as a family, it has like a whole guide to it. So first it's introduction, how to start and such. And then in between each day of the week there is a little challenge for you. And um, some of them are really simple. I think they actually start you out slow. They're like, hmm, well, how about everyone choose a storybook to read together, right? And so that's good. And honestly, this works if you're an you know, older couple. Like, when was the last time you sat down and read together, right? And that means you maybe read a story from the Bible together. So, you know, be creative and, and step it up if you need to. And then I would say, and then as it goes along, it says, you know, tell each person in your family what you love about them, or hold and pray over um, each person in your family. And then at the end, the last week, guides you through, you know, it starts with Luke, 
and the, uh, Luke 1 and then to Luke 2, and it walks you through. So it was um, a really beautiful experience. So these are going to be available for you in um, a basket by the entry hallway. Take one of this and one of this per family. All right? And you don't have to have children to do it. It's, uh, uh, even if it's just you and you want to choose a, a friend that doesn't even come here and you say, hey, let's do this together. I'm going to call you today and we're going to do something on this. It's a great way to reach out to somebody else and draw them in to this Advent experience. Um, you know, I know for me, before I even get into this message of hope, just talking about that devotional and the idea of Advent and what we just saw in the, in the video, um, something my family and I have done now for years is <coughs> Sunday, the Sunday evenings of Advent, we sit around the dining room table and um, just kind of have devotion together, like a candle, sing a song. I'm not going to lie, two teenagers. Sometimes they, they're like, really, this is funny, we're going to sing a song, and I'm like, yes, we are going to sing a song. And we, we, we sing a, a carol, um, and we spend time in prayer, and as my kids have gotten older, um, actually last year, I think it was the first year, where I gave them a week, and I said, okay, June, this is your week, you pick the, song, the carol you want to sing, you pick the Christmas scripture you want to read, and kind of give them ownership over it. While one is away, I think we're going to FaceTime her tonight and try and keep that tradition alive. So I encourage you to just spend some time. This, this is bumping. Where do you want me to put this, Rich? I don't know. Maybe? Yes? Better? Um, you know, society makes this time so chaotic and crazy. And I think that, I just want to encourage all of us, and I encourage myself, to take the time to to allow peace and forget it. To allow peace and uh, just some reflection to kind of come into this season. Nice. All right. So hope. Our um, our topic today is hope, and I would like us to look at a, a scripture lesson from Romans 15, 12 to 15. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will spring up, one who will arise to rule over the nations. In him the Gentiles will hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. What is hope? That was my, my question this week as I was, I've been contemplating um, you know, the hope, peace, Joy and love, they're four very traditional Advent themes. Um, I started thinking about the nature of that word and actually how, in English, we maybe overuse it. How many of you know I'm a, I'm a Spanish teacher. I love looking at words. I feel like words that, that people use are very powerful. Every language has different kinds of words, and sometimes you can't even translate exactly from one language to another. And I really feel like hope is one of those one of those words. We use hope in interesting ways in English. You know, I, mean, I have Michael's one of my Spanish students, so maybe Michael comes into my Spanish class and he sits there. Oh, I hope we don't have homework tonight, right? <laughs> or maybe after three nights of he's feeding my son Brussels sprouts, he might come home and say, oh, I hope we're getting pizza tonight. Or maybe you hope you win the lottery. The thing is, those are wishes. Right? Those are just shots in the dark. Those are wishes. Those are fleeting emotions, maybe, or feelings that we have. That is not biblical hope. To have biblical hope is to have a secure anchor for the soul, as we read about in Hebrews 6.19. In fact, the word for hope in Greek and in many other languages, it also means expect, and it means wait. To hope, to expect, and to wait. Expect and waiting. It's not like making a wish on a birthday candle or a shooting star. It's the firm expectancy and confidence that what was promised will be. <laughs> Expected waiting. So what is it that we are waiting for? Let's take a look at uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, 3 to 5. Praise <clears throat> be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope 
through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, this inheritance is kept in heaven for you. You, through faith, are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. So what are we waiting for? We are, we're told that through the resurrection of Jesus, we have new birth into a living hope, and we've been given an inheritance, an inheritance that cannot be taken away, an inheritance that is not going to rust, it's not going to fade, it's not going to disappear, and it's an inheritance that is kept in heaven for us until the last day. That's what we are waiting for, for that inheritance to come in full. As I was um, doing some research and reading and praying um, about the topic of hope, I came up upon this pastor's kind of blog online, and he used the imagery of um, a forest fire, or after a forest fire, to talk about hope. And it made me, um, put that image up there, it made me think about um, a trip my family and I had taken three, four years ago. Nathan and the kids and I, we did a three-week road trip to all these national parks and went out to the West Coast and moved around. Um, and one of our first stops was in South Dakota in the Black Hills. We went to uh, Jewel Cave National Park. And back in, in 2000, in August of 2000, that area of the Black Hills suffered what was called the Jasper Fire. And it was an intentionally set forest fire that ended up burning over 83,000 acres of the Black Hills in South Dakota. And now we were there you know, years after. Um, but you could still see you know, the remnants, some charred trees, blackened bark. But the thing is, the floor of the forest is no longer thick with ash. Instead, a host of plants and new trees and new life has rebounded from the fire. Throughout the landscape, despite the destruction, despite the ruin, there are signs of life and regeneration and rebirth that's coming up out of that room. That idea of, uh, I love that idea, the imagery that despite destruction, despite tragedy, despite <clears throat> life can come forth. And that's hope. Right? Despite our own sin, despite our own ruinous existence, when Christ comes in, he brings new life rise up out of the ashes. Hope is the conviction that the future has the potential to be better than the present. It's the belief that something beautiful can emerge from the ashes of failure and shame. Hope is feeling the hands of the potter as they pick up the pieces of a broken existence and begin to reassemble them into something new. The people of God, the nation of Israel, waited hundreds and hundreds of years for a Messiah. And the Old Testament has numerous prophecies of the coming Messiah, yet Israel's attention and their fervency for the Messiah kind of ebbed and flowed over the years. And maybe that's kind of like ours. When we talked about us as a church, the church, being and waiting for the second coming, and maybe our fervency and our attention to that reality ebbs and flows over time. The fact that many of the messianic prophecies have already been fulfilled down to the last detail, and you look at the scripture that Sue read for us from Isaiah, that the virgin will be with child, so many prophecies from the Old Testament that were fulfilled in the first coming of Jesus. That fact that they were fulfilled down to the last detail, it assures us of the accuracy, the faithfulness, the reliability of the word of God. If all of the prophecies pertaining to his first coming were fulfilled precisely, we have every reason to believe that the remaining prophecies will also be fulfilled. Right? So we wait, we stand on that hope, but we, we know that God's word has come true and proven faithful over and over again. Let's look at Romans 8, 24 and 25. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? If we
We hope for what we do not yet have. We wait for it patiently. That's us. We wait for Jesus to come again. We wait for all things to be made right. We wait for that time where there will be no more tears, where there will be no more pain, where there will be no more sickness. And we have that assurance that that day will come because he has proven himself faithful time and time again. Now, when Jesus came the first time, his arrival did not necessarily fulfill everyone's expectations. There were some people who wished that the Messiah would come and be this great warrior who was going to lead some kind of overthrow of Rome. And there were others, maybe some of the religious leaders, who wished he didn't come at all. They didn't want an upset in the order of things, in their power, in their influence, in their position. And I have to ask, do we sometimes fall into the trap, maybe like the first group of setting our hopes, or maybe their really wishes, on our own fleshly desires, not aligning them with God's will? Or do we sometimes fall on the other side and maybe just not hope at all and seek to live the same unchanged life we've been living? Because it's familiar. And Kathy Charlin shared a message about that, that going into uh, places that are maybe uncomfortable. Sometimes maybe we don't hope at all because we'd rather the known than the unknown. The thing is, when we read the Gospels, it's not the hope of Jesus Christ. Every time, whether it's in the manger in Bethlehem, or whether it's um, when he comes across a blind man, or the lame, or whether he comes across Zacchaeus who's just completely sick of himself, every time Jesus shows up, he comes up and he changes. With power to change, Jesus comes and he changes everything. He comes into our lives to give us hope and a future. But we, like the people of the Old Testament, we wait also, but we wait differently. That first waiting, it's different than our position. Jesus has already come to earth. He's fully God, fully man, God with us, Emmanuel. But we wait with an, an extra gift that they didn't have in the Old Testament. Let's look at that in Ephesians 1, 13-14. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who was a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession, to the praise of his glory. We wait differently. Scripture says in Ephesians that for every single one of us here, heard the message of truth, the message of salvation for every person sitting in this room right now. If you have believed, you've been given a seal, a mark, a deposit. You have the Holy Spirit. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit in you as a guarantee of that inheritance that is to come. So we wait differently. We wait with the Holy Spirit indwelling in us. That Holy Spirit that if we look back at our scripture lesson from Romans uh, 5.13 tells us is the power that enables us to be overflowing with hope. Last weekend, um, my husband Nathan and I were uh, found ourselves in a used bookstore. And he often drags me in there and he loves looking for old jazz books or something like that. So we're in the basement of this old bookstore and while he is going nuts about Miles Davis and Louis Armstrong. I was just roaming around aimlessly looking uh, through the shelves of the musty old books. But um, I came across this interesting book, and it's not really what the book was about, but it's the title that grabbed me. It was a book about a high school girls basketball team um, from the 90s. And the title said, For These Girls, Hope is a Muscle. And yeah, I walked by, I was like, oh, that's weird. And then kind of like, ah, I'm looking at that. And that imagery of hope being a muscle, of hope being something that needs to be exercised, really grabbed me. And the less we use a muscle, the less strength it has. 
can even atrophy from disuse. So how do we exercise our hope muscle? That was my question after reading that. And we need to wait expectantly, right? Not just wishing, waiting expectantly. We pray eagerly, and we encourage one another in hope. That's where I want us to kind of sit for the remaining few minutes of this message. We encourage one another in the hope of Jesus. Now, the period of time um, between the Old Testament and the New is often referred to by theologians as the silent period. So over 400 years from the book of Malachi to Matthew where there is no prophet of God. And this remnant, this small remnant that remains of God's people, they wait. And I have to believe that in that time, they must have really needed one another. They must have really needed one another to remind one another of who God is and how faithful God had been. You know, we really see that behavior throughout the Old Testament where the people of Israel, they remind themselves over and over again, he is the God who brought us out of slavery in Egypt. Right? They, they wait, but I have to imagine that they needed one another to say, hey, he's going to show up, he's coming. The Messiah is coming. And as dark as that time must have been, they, they spurred one another on in hope. And I think that we, as a people of waiting, people who are waiting for him to come again, and even people who are waiting for, for a kingdom encounter in our own lives right now, even before he comes again, we need to be encouraging one another to live our lives with hope. Now, biblical encouragement, it's not complimenting one another. You know, it's not like, oh, Sadie, I really love your haircut. Well, that's a nice thing, you know? Or it's not, you know, it's not like you have the best pumpkin bread recipe, which is also a nice, it's nice to compliment one another, right? But that's not exactly what biblical encouragement is. Encouragement that scripture talks about is shared with the hopes that it will lift someone's heart toward the Lord. It points out the evidence of grace in another person's life and it helps them to see how God is working in them. It points a person to God's promises that assures them that everything they are facing is under his control. Let's go 1 Thessalonians 4, 17 to 18. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. We will be with him forever, right? We're waiting for that day. We will be with him forever. And we're told to encourage one another with these words. So the last time I was up here, I kind of forgot. Kathleen mentioned it last week. But usually, I mean, the few times I've been up here, I put on my teacher hat and I give homework, right? Because you know teachers. We love to give homework, right? what we live for. Um, so, you know, it's what we live for, Fred said, it's what we die But, <laughs> I am going to give you homework, and in all seriousness, uh, in this Advent season, I really want to encourage you. I'm not going to hand out any homework passes today. No pass. First of all, I encourage you, Second Baptist, to pray, to spend time this week and in this Advent season to pray that God would create a culture of encouragement here in our church, here in our body. Ask God to make our church a community that loves each other in specific, tangible ways, that encourages one another to hang on to the Word of God, to hope against hope, to hope that Jesus is going to come into our situations come into our lives, and like I said, when Jesus shows up, he brings power and he brings change. So I'm going to ask you again, pray for our church that we will be an encouraging body, one that lifts each other up. And I'm also going to ask that you pray specifically that God show you someone who you can encourage this week. 
You know, I always feel, um, I don't know about you, but do people randomly pop into your mind sometimes? You're dri driving to work or you're doing laundry and all of a sudden someone pops into your mind. And um, I really believe that we shouldn't dismiss that. Sometimes that's the Holy Spirit working on us and saying, say a prayer for that person right now. So I encourage you to ask God, and I, I, I believe he will show you someone, many people, who need encouragement this week. Pick up the phone, text, give them a message, show up on their doorstep, say, hey, God wanted me to share this with you. You never know what kind of um, encouragement that could be. Uh, this week, a dear friend of mine uh, <coughs> gave me this bracelet, which if you can't see it, has an acorn on it. And the card that came with it says, the acorn is a reminder that one small seed of hope has the potential to grow into something mighty. I needed that this week. God knew I needed that this week. And he used that friend to speak that word of hope into my life. So this Advent season, Second Baptist, is we wait expectantly for his return. Let us encourage one another with the hope of Christ. Let us encourage one another with his word. We have an inheritance in him. He is coming again, and we will be with him forever. So together we say, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your word is true. That we stand here now, Lord, as believers who have the gift of your Holy Spirit in us, Lord, and we can look back over Scripture and we see, God, how you have fulfilled so many prophecies. God, we are a people who wait eagerly for the fulfillment of everything. For you to come again, Lord, and take us with you, for us to be with you forever. And Lord, as we wait, pray that you will help us wait actively. Help us be encouragers. Help us lift each other up, Lord, to see you in all things every day. We pray this, Jesus, by the power of your name. Amen.